Good day, everyone. Um, I'm Nitin Jawakar. I'm on the faculty at Question School of Business, and I've had the privilege of thinking about uh, supply chains uh, for a number of years. And today, um, the privilege is doubled because we will be able to host a conversation with Ishan Gupta. Ishan is, uh, as you guys know, a member of the BU India Leadership Council, uh, and he's graduated, um, and I do remember him very well from his uh, days at uh, Questrom uh, in 2010 with a degree in um, business administration. And now he is the Joint Managing Director of Gateway Industrial Park Limited, a really fascinating company. And I do not want to steal his thunder because I'm going to ask him a lot about his company. Uh, so hold on for a few minutes and you'll hear about really cool stuff in my mind that um, his team um, has been doing in India. So with that, uh, Ishan, uh, why don't we kick off our conversation? Hi, Professor, and thanks for the kind introduction. And it's great to be connected again after so many years, uh, especially at the opportunity of this forum. Um, there's a lot to discuss and talk about in this world of logistics. So uh, maybe we can start with uh, getting some viewpoints uh, since uh, you have a global viewpoint on this. Uh, from you, you serve on the Global Future Council for Advanced Manufacturing and Value Chains at the World Economic Forum, which sounds fascinating. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about that. And uh, from there, what you know about the local and global supply chains and how they've moved in the post-COVID era, especially. Certainly. So first of all, I have the privilege of uh, working with the World Economic Forum team, uh, both in terms of companies, uh, some of the largest companies in the world, but also about 100 lighthouse companies, startups uh, in a variety of areas that touch um, production and supply chain management. So a lot of uh, ideas I'll share uh, have drawn from that experience. Uh, so the first thing that I want to talk about uh, is what has really changed uh, in the supply chain space uh, since the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, and really, there are three major uh, stakeholders uh, who really uh, alter their perspective. First of all, for consumers, uh, I think that supply chains have become a household word. People feel the pinch, people understand the complexity, or at least perceive that there's complexity, uh, and uh, react to it sometimes by stocking things up or sometimes uh, um, figuring things out in a variety of ways. So the consumer end has changed. Uh, the second thing is that Supply chains about 10 years ago or so used to be sort of a functional area, like a silo within uh, corporations. And that has really changed for CEOs. Uh, this has become front and center uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because a lot of data uh, for their operations or for their finance or whatever else is directly coming from the supply chain, both inbound supply chain stuff that's coming in, but also things uh, towards customers or outbound supply chain, that a lot of real-time data is coming from supply chains um, and they really have to uh, react very fast. And this has really changed uh, since COVID much more so. So actually I remember one particular CEO sort of saying, how do I unlearn everything that I had to learn uh, during COVID? Uh, this is Black and Decker, um, uh, as the way people have adjusted um, and finally, uh, public policies, they have also changed dramatically. I mean, um, uh, Brexit now is somewhat old news, but since uh, COVID, uh, there's been a number of changes in public policies, regionalization of supply chains and so on. So really, uh, the marketplace has changed is my first impression. Yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. And especially when you say that, you know, logistics or supply chain used to be uh, a hidden department in the company, and now it's one of the key areas for any manager to focus on. Um, there are a lot of new innovations happening in the industry, uh, both from a technology point of view, but also some different methodologies or new strategies. Uh, what would you say, you know, uh, in your view, is happening in the new supply chains which are being formed in the short term of, say, between now and five years from now? Good question. Uh, so there's a lot going on. And as business school majors, I would say the biggest news is that it's changing business models. Uh, people are doing things in completely new ways, uh, either because of supply chains or enabled by supply chains. So here would be sort of three uh, bullet points, if you will. 
one news here is platforms. And there's a lot of work going on at Western, for example, in this area. But in some sense, a whole kinds of business models you can think of. Uh, think of Uber. Uh, everybody knows that's a supply chain for cars. Um, uh, starting, uh, which most of us know, but it's uh, other platforms. So, for example, the largest uh, shipping line, the world, one of the largest marks has a new Vorpia platform called Neonap that tracks things uh, all the way from end to end. So a consumer... Uh, such as Unilever or a partner, a business to business partner like such as Unilever can track their own flow of goods in real time um, and make decisions. So platforms are creating opportunities and business models and hand in hand with the platforms are these amazing new technologies for tracing such as blockchain so that um, there's data driven decisions. So uh, we worked on a project where there was a, major disruption in Thailand in terms of fish supplies to the UK. And the idea is that now the places we put cold storage or book cold storage because of this, and I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on this, um, uh, Ishan, uh, have changed. Uh, uh, there's a third issue also, and the third issue, which is a little bit hidden, which is as a teacher, uh, this is of a huge concern for us, is what I would call as the lack of trained talent. Um, and it's going to take us some amount of time uh, to get the really right people, um, savvy people um, who know these technologies, uh, and it'll take about five years or so to, to turn that around. And there's also issues about fairness and diversity there because uh, supply chains are truly distributed, which means you want to make sure that the teams have the fair share of workloads and working hours and, um, and also diversity issues. It's also a number of uh, so the business model is just not how you sort of recognize revenue, but it is also a, about how you make decisions uh, closer to the consumers, away from the consumers, and also how you deliver. And a lot of deliveries in terms of what I would call as uh, ex extremely well-trained talent. And the World Economic Forum has been a huge, I mean, a very, very worried about the talent issue. I was in Detroit about uh, 10 days ago uh, at the Advanced Manufacturing Center, and I was literally with I would say almost uh, 50 CEOs in different tables. And every table had talent as probably the most, most pressing need uh, in this area. How to get the best people, just not any people. Uh, again, what you raise are very uh, interesting insights. And especially, you know, I've seen over the years in the logistics industry, uh, while things have been changing constantly, but in the last three or four years, the amount of innovation and uh, new people looking at this industry, which has come in, is, is so high that uh, I think that in the short term, all these changes are coming. They'll settle down. Uh, in the longer term, we might we might see a very different industry from where it is now. What is your long term prognosis prognosis for so, supply chains to come? Uh, as we know, um, difficult to make a longer term forecast. Forecasting is what we do in supply chains. Uh, we do scenarios in the longer term. Um, and again, uh, this is based on a number of interviews and conversations. So there's three major themes here also. Uh, the first, which is, I'm sure you've thought a lot about this, is in, in, in sort of front of us uh, in a variety of ways. It's climate and sustainability. It's things like carbon footprints, but it's just not carbon footprints. It's also extreme weather. Uh, things that we're just not prepared to that happen that just throw off supply chains for a um, for a very uh, um, difficult spin, and they've been happening more and more often. Things like water shortages, a major issue in a number of places. And what that does is, uh, so in California, the wine industry is suffering in a big way. And I've worked a little bit in Punjab um, lately, and uh, same uh, Punjab in India, um, a similar kind of uh, issue in a variety of ways. So my sense is that it's going to be a little bit problematic for a while before it gets better. Um, that's one story. Uh, the second story is supply chains are becoming extremely specialized. So when you think about supply chain for e-commerce, the way Amazon or Alibaba runs it, uh, or in India, there's wonderful new startups coming in this area. They are a little bit different uh, because of the speed at which items need to go and the way the market expects the delivery, delivery times and last mile versus things like food. And you know a lot about this. Uh, food and pharma. Those supply chains are very specialized. 
um, wastage or preserving food and keeping that fresh becomes a central story uh, of pharma, where it's fairness and speed now with mRNA technology and so on. How do we get these things to the people who actually deserve them? Um, and uh, we, we saw, especially in the pharma supply chain, the issues during COVID. And it was just not a PPE and other things. So it has become a very specialized area and um, people are making very specialized choices in each one of these kinds of supply chains. There's some common containerization kind of an idea that I'm sure you speak to, but, but then beyond that, as we go towards the consumer end, um, we see a lot more specialization. And the last thing is that it is infrastructure. It really matters. And uh, uh, in our view, infrastructure is never solved by any one entity. So the ports, the roads, the governments are making investments. In the U.S., we almost spent, uh, we're about to spend a trillion dollars out of which a sizable amount is going towards a supply chain and transportation. Um, and then Wall Street. So I've talked with some of our own former students on Wall Street and companies like J.P. Morgan, who are really uh, investing uh, in infrastructure for transportation, serious amount of money, buying ships, I mean, ships are not cheap, um, but uh, the Wall Street kind of money, I mean, that's a lot more access in terms of reducing the friction in accessing capital. And it behooves uh, Wall Street also to do this because if they have a better position on infrastructure, then their own risk profile is improved. So they are motivated to sort of work in this area. And finally, low companies. Um, um, Lots and lots of startups. I mean, just about every week in these lighthouse companies that we work in, all the way from uh, Silicon Valley to Bangalore or in Indonesia or wherever I could hear from some of our own former students uh, who are trying to use the digital glue or digital magic in supply chain. So lots of stuff to talk about, but I feel as though that's sort of been you know, this is what not this should be doing, right? We should be proactive. So I want to sort of stop talking about my observations. If I may, maybe uh, I'll turn this around, uh, Sean, and ask you uh, a few questions, if you don't mind. Uh, so let's start with uh, India in particular. Uh, so how have supply chains evolved uh, over time across different modalities of transportation? And you can describe those modalities. Um, and what kinds of infrastructure is sort of coming into play in this area? Love to hear that. No, no, that's uh, it, it's it's it ties in very well with uh, what you were just talking about. Um, in and India would be a good example because uh, a lot has changed in the last few decades. Uh, so you know you can see the trends which which have been carried on in India. Some of the newer trends, while skipping some of the things which developed countries did earlier, which India no longer needs to go through. Um, so if you go back uh, to you know sometime in the 50s is, I think, when the first containerized shipment took place. Uh, and before that, all goods were carried in either bulk form or brake bulk form, but still, uh, you know, on open trucks or open vessels, you needed specialized equipment to handle each different kind of commodity. Uh, you had to worry about return hauls because if you're carrying, say, coal in a specialized vessel from point A to point B, uh, you need to bring back the vessel empty for the next shipment. Uh, those kind of problems, you know, are taken care of by containerizing, which is using a standard unit which can be handled all across the world. And uh, the level of containerization from bulk has been going up and up. Uh, it's hard to get the data on this because it's so different in every country. But generally speaking, developed countries are at a level of 70% uh, containerization. You know, so of all the goods which can be uh, transported in containers, that's they've reached about 70% on average. Uh, other developing countries, and uh, I'm sure some of the countries in Asia, which are part of this forum, uh, the mark is around 40, 45%. Uh, so there's a way to go, but you know there's a good amount achieved. Uh, India, on the other hand, is, is one of the few which is lagging behind. Uh, and even on a best year, we would be around 25%. So there's a lot of scope, uh, but you can't you know, just choose that, okay, from tomorrow onwards, I'm going to change uh, my method and instead of using uh, a bulk uh, carrier or, or, or a truck, 
I'm going to start sending it in containers. You need the infrastructure to do that, not only at, at your own end as a manufacturer or as a user, but throughout the chain. There's capital expenditure, both by the government as well as private parties, uh, or, or a joint venture with, with the government and with the private parties. And what it's leading to is that uh, there's good enough infrastructure coming in all parts of India. Uh, as you know, India is widely spread and then we have different areas where which specialize for either raw materials or finished goods, you know, manufacturing hubs are in, located in different facilities. Um, a lot of the uh, trade which India does, uh, both import and export, happens from hinterland locations. So they need a good way to transport to the nearest ports. Uh, so that's where rail has come in. And uh, with the recent investments in freight corridors, uh, especially dedicated freight corridors, uh, you know, finally, this level of containerization is going up and there's a shift from uh, using only road uh, as a mode of transportation to using multimodal where the first and last mile is taken care of by the road. Uh, but the longest part, which is possible, is done by uh, railways. Uh, even to some extent, inland waterways are coming up. So when you uh, have the options available, you know, the transportation becomes more efficient. Uh, it's not only for the customer that the cost goes down, but as a country, you know, you're moving goods more efficiently, which is more sustainable. It's better for the environment. Um, so, yeah, I, I think in time, this multimodal strategy is going to play a key role in India's growth. Uh, and it will help, uh, you know, India aims to be uh, more competitive in exports than it is right now. So supply chain has a key role to play for that. Thank you for sharing that. That's a very rich answer. And hopefully, um, I know there's some wonderful videos and we'll be able to showcase some of them as a part of this uh, thing. And I'll also point out um, that all of Asia, um, so places like China, uh, particularly the East Coast of China, um, uh, uh, Malaysia, for example, or, or Singapore, have uh, and others uh, have made uh, similar kinds of uh, investments. Um, some are a little more integrated, some are less, and so on. So what you're describing is a really complex system. So what I want to do is actually drill down a little bit. Actually, if you don't mind, uh, please don't be bashful and actually boast a little bit because what you're doing is very cool. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the uh, your foray into the agri uh, supply chain. So things like agriculture, dairy, poultry, uh, what are some unique trends there, both on the consumption side, perhaps, but equally important on the um, storage, distribution, collection? Um, and what are some things that uh, your team has done? The consumption trend has always been growing. And uh, uh, I think, you know, Professor, but for the benefit of everyone, uh, there are certain cities in India which are identified as tier one cities or they are the major metropolitan cities. And then we have tier two and tier three, which are the upcoming cities in, in different states and, and where there's a lot of economic development happening right now. Uh, there we see, a, you know, very fast growing consumption trends um, in terms of, you know, eating out and more restaurants, more takeaway, more delivery. And then even for household goods and, you know, shifting uh, some of your consumption from domestic goods to imported goods, uh, you know, the purchasing power of those individuals is growing quite exponentially. So in the cold chain space, uh, you know, there is a very uh, wide requirement for a good network of facilities which are spread across India, uh, which are connected by transportation for the long haul as well as short distance transportation within the city for distribution. Um, unfortunately, in India, this was a segment which was lagging behind. Uh, there were a lot of unorganized warehouses which were linked to agriculture produce, uh, but they were not modern or high quality, which could take care of some of the more demanding products. Um, we found this opportunity and uh, we acquired this company, Snowman Logistics, uh, which we've been able to grow. Uh, now we're present in 17 cities. And uh, thanks to that network, we can now... Uh, you know, cover all the major consumption areas in the country as well as the major production. Uh, for example, India is uh, one of the largest seafood exporters to the world. Uh, most of that happens on the east coast of India. 
down from Calcutta all the way down to Chennai. Um, so we are located at those places as an example of where we are close to the production. And then apart from that, you know, we are at the cities where, where the restaurants want to expand and uh, we provide a single platform where if, if a new chain comes into India, for example, Tim Hortons just uh, uh, arrived in India. We, they opened five stores in Delhi and they're opening so many more across the country. Uh, so they signed up with us and we give them a single platform to, uh, you know, open up wherever they want. Their scalability is faster. Uh, and this actually opened up uh, avenues for some uh, innovative ideas, you know, which our team had. So we, we've now become the first company, whole chain company in India to move into 5PL. So someone new coming into India who wants to open 50 stores right away in the first few months, they can do that by work, working through us. Uh, so, you know, it's not just cold chain, it's not just storage and transportation. Uh, you have to move from... Uh, say a storage company or a transportation company to a food services company or a distribution company. Um, yeah, uh, that, that has been, uh, uh, you know, something which has been very interesting and new for us. And I think the next phase of growth, we'll see a lot more of those activities rather than traditional storage. Uh, technology also has played a very crucial role in cold chain for us. Um, for example, we, we are proud that when, uh, you know, in the early part of COVID, when the first couple of vaccines were announced in India, we were able to transport them all over the country. Uh, and thanks to the technology integration that we have, you know, we could pass on the data to the hospitals, to the governments and to the end users, uh, you know, for tracking temperature and real-time monitoring of, of all the vaccines. Uh, similarly, you know, for e-commerce companies like Amazon, we've, uh, really invested heavily into technology so that we can service their requirements. Um, uh, th there's so much more I can talk about on cold chain, so I don't know if we have enough time today, but happy to answer anything else that you may have. So, so, so first of all, thank you. Right? Uh, these kinds of tasks, uh, these kinds of activities have saved much. I mean, things could have been much worse in a country like India or in other parts of Asia, um, especially during COVID. A lot of people worked on these challenges and, and a part of that is just not delivery of goods, but also the information, the way you mentioned that you've shared. So thank you so much uh, for, for this really important service. And I think that this is a challenge that's gonna uh, stay with us. I wanna sort of switch the conversation a little bit and bring this back to the kind of critical thinking that we, all our graduates, uh, different parts of BU are good at. And one of the things that we really try to do uh, is to uh, train people uh, to look at things from a multiple uh, perspectives, different perspectives, be critical about it. So talk a little bit about uh, the, this fascinatingly distributed uh, chain of inbound, outbound, near to the consumers, uh, thing is happening plus warehouses. How has the decision-making chain, what kind of matrix, what do you measure, what do you track? Uh, love to uh, learn, learn about that. Yeah, no, uh, you're right. Uh, very, it's it's you know the talk of the town after, especially after COVID. Uh, everyone is really looking at how they can uh, model the supply chain better. Especially you know after the pandemic, it caused uh, people to rethink. Uh, some some large factories uh, remained shut even after the lockdowns were lifted. Uh, you know, because they did not uh, anticipate such disruptions and then uh, their suppliers could not either produce it on time or it was stuck in some warehouse somewhere in some part of the world, you know, and a uh, lot, of, lot of new thinking had to be done. Uh, something common we've seen across a lot of our customers is that they have evaluated within their product mix what is uh, key for which market. So essential products, they've, uh, you know, ramped up the warehousing of those uh, so that in any key of market, uh, you know, when, when there's an order or when the consumer demands it, then they can quickly supply those products to them. Typically, you know, these would be higher margin or higher value products. And then the ancillary part or the non-essential items, uh, they've reduced uh, inventory of those. They've tried to spread those across multiple locations so that if 
something goes wrong uh, at any one location, they can still service from a nearby facility, you know, as an emergency. Uh, another thing which is happening is uh, in India domestically, as well as globally from what we hear from our customers, uh, people are de-risking uh, procurement of their raw materials for their production. Uh, you know, they don't want to be reliant on any one single source. Uh, so going ahead, we're seeing within India, you know, people have uh, opened up procurement channels in different states rather than, uh, you know, a single facility. And then because of that, they need, uh, say, if, if they have three different states, they need at least three warehouses as compared to one large one earlier. Uh, similarly, it's happening in, in the global field where if uh, any one country was, uh, you know, too dependent on another country for certain supplies, uh, we're even seeing that now with the fallout of, you know, the Russia and Ukraine situation. Uh, so companies are trying to de-risk themselves and spread geographically which then changes their model of warehousing, of, uh, you know, where to book their shipments from. Uh, it, again, brings containerization into play because it's so much easier to move things around if, if there are standard units available. Um, so those are some of the changes which we are seeing so far. Uh, I, mean, I, I think of this as a very foundational change that we are describing then because instead of going for a simple-minded cost reduction, quick delivery solution, you're building, uh, you're arguing that people are building uh, both in terms of your industry, logistics, supply chains, but other industries, what I would call as much more resilient um, and more risk tolerant uh, systems, uh, which is kind of where we need to go. Uh, that's definitely a trend and you've given some really nice examples. So I know we're running um, a little short on time. Uh, so in the last segment of this conversation, I want to sort of bring this back to sort of two thing, things which are very close to our heart. Uh, one is innovation. And then the second thing is young people in their careers. So let's pick up the innovation thing first. Um, so perhaps take us, uh, uh, and I know that as I travel in India, and I'm always amazed at the stories of the way people are innovating, sometimes with lower uh, access to capital, but still very, bold moves and so on. So uh, in different parts of the supply chain pieces, so warehouses or delivery, uh, give us some thoughts on where the innovation is coming. Uh, well, the plague of the logistics industry is that usually in, in every market, in every part of the world, uh, there is more supply than demand, uh, not counting the last couple of years. So because of that, you know, your pricing is always under pressure and there's not much you can play around with on, on pricing. You can always offer some value add services and solve specific problems to customers and, you know, get a premium for that. But still at the end of the day, you can't really control your pricing much. So it's one of those industries where you're always looking at cost reduction. Uh, I, I'm sure in today's time, every industry is doing that, but being from logistics, I, I always feel that uh, everyday thought is how can we, reduce our cost further. And that leads to innovations. Uh, one of the wonderful things which is happening in this industry is that uh, there's a very strong focus on reducing your carbon footprint. And that goes hand in hand with the innovations and with reducing your cost. So a lot of the measures which, uh, which are available in the industry and which slowly people are adopting uh, are both, you know, it's, it's not contradictory that you can either do something more, which is more sustainable, but at a higher cost. It's actually helping both on the logistics side. You reduce your cost as well as help the environment. Um, some of the examples are, you know, there is a lot of uh, aggregation startups which have come up uh, for aggregating fleets, for aggregating warehouse space, uh, you know, any spare capacity in any form on, on the shipment side or on vessels. Uh, the other ones are, you know, there's a lot of technology. So, for example, you can auto, uh, bring in a lot of automation into container yards, into ports, into warehouses, uh, which has an initial capex, but then your running cost is cheaper. And again, it's better for the environment and your customers are happier working with you uh, if you have, you know, more efficient systems in place. Uh, you mentioned Maersk earlier and uh, one of the uh, platforms which they've developed, which is catching on really well in the world, is called Trade Lens. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, they developed it with uh, IBM. Mm -hmm. And now most of the major shipping lines are on it. A lot of the ports, a lot of the customs authorities are on it. And what it entails is using blockchain for all the documentation which takes place during import or export, uh, which is a lot of documentation. So not only does it make things easier for tracking, for uh, you know submitting documents to customs for compliances and so on, uh, it's also helping reduce paperwork in a big way, uh, which helps the environment, which frees up time for people to focus on other activities. Um, in cold chain, there are so many examples. Uh, we've uh, tied up with IFC from, from the World Bank, uh, and they have a platform called Tech Emerge, mm -hmm. where they're bringing innovators from all over the world uh, to provide us with solutions. Uh, you know, we do test runs on our vehicles at our warehouses. Uh, and there are some very fun and cool ideas, like uh, someone has developed a special kind of paint, and if you paint your warehouse with, on the outside with that, uh, it absorbs less sunlight and, you know, you can save on cooling costs. Uh, there are some other alternate fuel vehicles available. So not just switching to EV, but even for the refrigeration component, uh, there are some phase change materials available, which, which you can charge and then they keep the cooling going for a long time. So a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, new startups, and that actually leads to attracting a lot of new talent. So, uh, you know, for for the new alumni from BU or, or the uh, you know current students who are looking forward to their life after graduation, I would strongly urge uh, uh, strongly urge to take a look at logistics because uh, it's not what it used to be. It's it's a fun environment, a lot of new opportunities, and something very unique to this industry is that no matter what role you are doing, you you're never limited to one function or one department. This uh, job calls for you to be involved in multiple facets. So you get more experience. Uh, you get to meet a lot of people. And depending on what line of logistics you enter, you probably have to travel a lot. So it's a very in interesting in the industry. Uh, I would really urge everyone to take a look at it. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and thank you, uh, Asia Business Forum, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, and. Um, you know, this virtual conversation uh, shall continue uh, through emails and other means. Thank you so much.